Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and happy Wednesday to everybody out there. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We have a wonderful webinar this morning on travel. Uh, this webinar is being brought to you in collaboration with Trigger Trap by combining an incredibly powerful and intuitive free iPhone and Android app with the fastest, most reliable and affordable hardware in the world. Trigger Trap Mobile is the ultimate camera remote for photographers of all skill levels. You can go to triggertrap.com now to find the Trigger Trap Mobile Kit for your camera and take your travel photography to the next level. Um, this is also brought to you by iFi. You can download, organize, and back up your photos automatically now instead of manually two months from now. You can try iFi Cloud for free at iFi.com. This morning, we have Scott Wyden Kivowitz here with us. He's the community and blog wrangler at Photocrati and Next Gen Gallery, a blogger, a photographer, and an educator. Scott is also the author of Time is on Your Side, Exploring Long Exposure Photography, Go Wider with Panoramic Photography, and Ambivert's Guide to Street Photography. Scott's going to go for about 60 minutes this morning, and then we'll break for questions. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to ask them in the question box on the side of your screen, and we'll get as many as we can in at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll have it available on the i5 website in about a week or two. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Scott. Thanks. Um, I guess before I start, I just want to mention uh, it, there's a heat wave here in New Jersey, so I have my ceiling fan on. So if, that's, if anybody hears that and it's annoying, just put that in the questions or chat or wherever, and I'll turn that off. Um, but <laughs> uh, with that, uh, so... I love traveling and I love photography. So it's, it's always fun to talk about things that I have learned, tools that I found useful, and techniques that I use while, while on the road. I've been a professional photographer for over 10 years, but photography is not my full-time job. Uh, as it was just said, I work for Photocrati. Uh, we make, we're a WordPress development company making themes and the plugins for photography websites. My job is to interact with other photographers, so I've met many fantastic people over the years and traveled to some pretty cool places. I get to travel a bunch each year, some with my family, some for work, and of course, some for my own photographic adventures. What I consider to be travel photography could be different than what you might consider to be travel photography. To me, Travel photography is, a, is any photograph that is made while not near your home. Things like landscapes and cityscapes, street phot uh, photographs, all these fall under that category. For me, travel photography is usually unpaid and for myself, although I do sell prints and license photos afterwards. And some of the photos that you'll see today have been licensed and used uh, elsewhere outside of my own personal portfolio. I'm going to talk a bunch about gear, gear that I use while traveling, and if you'd like to see more details on everything I talk about, you can go to my website, uh, scottwine.com slash gear, and there you'll see a list of all the equipment that I use, and you can uh, links to each product, you can read more about it from there. So let's talk about gear. The photo you see here, see here is an iPhone photo I made while out in the Palouse, Washington area. There were two Mindship gear bags, two F-Stop gear bags, and multiple various other bags. Really right stuff tripods were used by many of us. There was, I believe, eight or nine of us on this one trip. Uh, if you want to see some fun data points on shutter counts and uh, different gear that was used, lenses and things like that, you can go to the um, website you see up there, thephotofrontier.com slash expedition palouse. There was a lot of fun gear. Some pretty cool travel stuff was used uh, along the way, and some money of which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I guess the first tip, actually, let me go back a slide. The first tip is if you're going to travel, um, 
with a group, I highly recommend a minivan if you're going places where a typical car can go because you can actually fit a lot of people. Uh, we had six people in the minivan, and uh, that is actually with all of that gear you see there plus a, a little bit extra. Um, and, and it was comfortable for every single person. And there was USB ports for charging phones and that kind of fun stuff. So minivans are, uh, in my opinion, the way to go. They cost a little bit more to rent, but uh, just for the comfort's sake, it's worth it. So my bag of choice for travel photography right now is the Mindshift Gear Rotation 180 Horizon 34L. That's a really long product name, but um, Mindshift Gear has multiple versions of their Rotation 180 bag, and this is their second to largest. The larger one is actually quite larger, uh, and it's taller and uh, deeper, and the waist belt part that you're seeing there can, is actually larger as well. Um, but the reason I went for this one is because it actually fits in the overhead on planes, and it's also large enough to hold my travel essentials, everything that I need while I'm out making photographs traveling. Um, I can also access my stored lenses without removing the backpack. That's the beautiful thing about this bag is that the waist part actually stays along, on your waist and slides in front of you so you can actually access anything in that pouch without removing the backpack. So this is the inside of that of that bag, of that waist part of it. Uh, inside the belt pack, I keep extra memory cards, my camera, unless I'm actively using it, a 28 to 300 for when I need distance. I used to carry my 70 to 200 2.8 with me everywhere, but it's too heavy for travel these days. Um, and I don't love the 20 to 300, but it's my choice for now. Um, in fact, I use, uh, there's a free website called lightroomdashboard.com, and through that I was able to determine that I actually don't need my 24 to 70 or my 70 to 200 2.8 lenses anymore. Because everything that I photographed in the past few years, even though I might be using those lenses, I'm not at 2.8 when I use those lenses. So I actually wound up uh, changing what lenses I'm using and caused my, my bag to just be lighter whenever I'm, whenever I'm out on the road. So although the 20 to 300 is not my favorite lens, when traveling it covers such a wide range and it gives me the apertures I need uh, when, for doing landscape work. So that's, that's what I bring. Uh, I do a lot of shooting with prime lenses. So my most common lens is the 35 millimeter focal range. I uh, recently got the 1.4 lens, and I've been so I've been using that, and I also use that for the We 35 project and for everyday use as well. Uh, so because 35 is my most used lens, that is always with me, even if I'm not traveling. Just it's always with me, and I'll talk about the We 35 shortly. Uh, it's a pretty cool project. The Nikon 20 millimeter is what I use for wide landscapes. I have the AFD model, which is not the current model. It's smaller than the current AFG model, and uh, I went with that because it is known to be uh, the sharpest 20 millimeter lens and has minimal distortion. So if I bring a photo that I made with the 20 millimeter lens into Lightroom, turn on lens correction, you see a tiny shift, but it's so minor that you don't even need to do it. Really all it does is it sort of, uh, that the lens correction will actually take away a little bit of the vignetting caused by the lens. So I switched from the Nikon 14 to 24 2.8 many years ago to the 20 millimeter because of the size and quality, and it's just a heck of a lot later. Um, and the, the 14 to 24, which I used to use, also can accept filters, uh, or to accept filters, it's actually a super expensive kit from Leaf Filter in order to, uh, to do that. So, of course, on top of all this, inside that pouch is also extra batteries. I never go anywhere without extra batteries. I partner with my friends at the Photo Frontier to help educate and inspire using a 35 millimeter lens. Each month, each month, 35 photographers go out on a mission. The mission changes 
each month, and is de uh, designated by Armando and Justin, who run the Photo Frontier. Uh, and it's a really fun project. At the end of the day, We35 is about loving photography and doing it by using only one lens, being a 35 millimeter lens. Uh, if you want to learn about it, it's pretty cool. You can check it out at photofrontier.com slash we35. Um, and it's, you actually do learn a lot. By going out with one lens, you actually learn a lot about yourself, about your, your own photography, and just what a 35 millimeter lens can do for you and how it can change your entire view on things. Um, even out when traveling, sometimes we'll, we'll just put down all the gear put down our backpacks, leave them in the hotel rooms or wherever, and just go out with one camera and a 35 millimeter, 35 millimeter lens because it just allows you to, to see everything in a whole new way and it's, you're putting, you're, everything else is behind you. you. You can't think about a different lens. You can't think about using filters because you're only using that lens and that's it. So inside the top compartment, uh, the top compartment of the MindShift gear bags, the Rotation 180s, are actually empty. You can get a molded compartment to put in it that holds that has additional dividers if you want additional lenses and things like that. But I leave mine empty because of what I put inside of it. So inside the top compartment, I neatly organize other necessities, some of which stay in the hotel when I'm out making photographs, some of which come uh, only if the weather requires it, and some only if I'm out at night, and so on. But typically, all of these items that I'm going to go through one by one will actually travel with me everywhere. So this is the trigger trap cable that goes with me everywhere. Um, I'll talk more about how I use this later on, but know that it's always in my bag. Everywhere it's in my bag because my phone is always with me as well. I also keep the phone trap with me so my phone can stay put on top of the camera instead of hanging out in the wind. And I also have a small clamp which can mount to the uh, side of my L bracket, which allows me to use the phone trap and have my phone in portrait mode, you know, have it in portrait orientation rather than landscape, which is great for doing periscoping, meerkat, any sort of live streaming that forces uh, portrait orientation. Also with me, and this is one of those things that stays in the hotel room uh, and I use it when I need it, this is the Western Digital My Passport Wireless. I have a two, the two terabyte version. The beautiful thing about this is that uh, you, it automatically imports the cards. It, you, it can accept an SDHC card and it automatically imports it once you, the device is on. You put the SD card in there, it reads it, sucks in all the photos, and it stores it on the two terabyte drive. It's also accessible through Wi-Fi if you want. You can make sure that your photos are there via you know, the mobile app. Um, but iOS devices, and I'm not sure about Android because I don't have an Android, but iOS devices can only read JPEGs. So if you only shoot to RAW, then this is only a backup. Okay? If you want to view the photos and do something with the photos that are there, you'd have to, of course, do it as a JPEG um, or see something else that I'll talk about in a little bit as well. Um, but I use this only as a backup, really, and I just use the app to make sure that it is backed up and I feel comfortable that my photos are safe there. So I never travel without this, ever. Um, so uh, I talk a lot about neutral density filters in my ebook on long exposure photography. I use lead filter NDs. They're the slide-in style, so you can use graduated filters, solid neutral density filters, or uh, even put a circular polarizer in front of it all using the, the CPL ring that you can put on the, as an attachment. I am starting to transition slowly to the Format High Tech brand, their Firecrest line of neutral density filters, due to the amazingly accurate color that it achieves. But transitioning is expensive, so right now I only have one Firecrest filter, which is their 16 stop, um, and eventually I will make the migration fully. My CPL that I had was a Sigma 105 uh, CPL, but I'm also switching to the Firecrest CPL as well, that's on order and on back order. So, um, but I store all those filters in one pouch. It's called the MindShift Filter Hive, and it keeps them snug, safe, uh, and uh, fits nicely in the MindShift gear bag and a lot of other bags very easily. Or I can just throw it on my 
on my belt and have it on my waist or anything like that. And it also attaches to the Mindshift Gear Rotation 180's waist belt that slides in front of you. The, the filter hive actually attaches to that as well. So um, neutral density filters, if you, if you want to learn more about it, you can just check it out on my website and go to the ebook section. You can, you'll see the Time is on your side ebook available there. Another thing that is always with me, and it stays in the hotel, it doesn't travel when I'm out actually making the photographs, but the Belkin Surge Plus 3 Outlet Mini Travel Swivel Charger Surge Protector with dual USB ports. Again, really long name for a product, but that's why I like to call it the Friend Maker. Uh, this surge swivels, so you're always out of the way from blocking another outlet. So the, the actual three-prong, uh, the, the, you know, the US three-prong three prong household plug will actually turn so that your uh, USB port on the top or on the left, on the right, on the bottom, wherever, so it's out of the way. Uh, so I can do three products. So I can, if I bring a laptop for some reason, I can plug that in. Or if I'm just bringing my iPad and iPhone, I can plug those in as well, just directly to the USB port. Um, so I always use this at airports to stay charged, and I can then make a friend and allow them to charge with me so that no, you know, no one's just mooching off of the rare outlets that are at the airport. Um, I also don't trust outlets that are on planes or trains or things like that, so I always use that this product because it's always a surge protect. It's also a surge protector as well, so it can pre prevent any potential damage from bad outlets. Being colorblind means having to rely on tools or other people to tell me if my color is accurate. The color checker passport is amazing. If I'm concerned about mixing light or strange light in any way, if I'm doing a portrait, anything like that, I can photograph the checker in the field, and then when I'm on the computer and inside of Lightroom, I can run the photo through the color checker passport software, and then add a custom color profile that is created for the most accurate color uh, for whatever photograph I need. And then if I really need extra help, I then ask my wife to <laughs> take a look to make sure the colors are accurate. Most of the time, I'm mostly concerned about skin tone when it comes to color accuracy. Uh, when I look at landscapes, I look at it more like it's artistic. I want the colors to be how I want them. So I'm not as concerned about color in that, at that point, depending on the situation. I have a few different battery backup USB chargers that I use for my iPhone or iPad. Because my iPhone is, is being used for my trigger trap, um, the battery can drain more and more. So I always carry at least one. Most of the time I have more than one. The one that you see on the right is from a company called Anchor. And uh, if I know I'll be out for an entire day, I'll, I'll also bring the FluxMob bolt, which is on the left. But the Anchor one has two USB ports and can charge an iPhone, I think, three times, or an iPhone and iPad um, once, both together. The FluxMob Bolt has one USB port and plugs directly into a wall as well. Um, they, FluxMob just came out with a, another one that has two USB ports, a little bit bigger, which I now have, and I haven't needed to travel yet since I got that. So I haven't had a chance to actually use it out and out and about, but uh, I will be bringing that from now on instead of the, the single because I'd rather have more juice. The cool part about the FluxMob bolt is that it's super light. Even the dual one is super light, actually much lighter than the Anchor one, but uh, I found the Anchor one is, is very reliable. Um, it, oh, it's never let me down, so uh, I, I definitely recommend having at least one. Two would be better, only because if you're doing things like, like, uh, like going with, an I, with the iFi or, or, or using a trigger trap or anything else on mobile, you're going to be draining faster and faster. So having a battery backup is important. My iPad is my mobile workstation. During downtime, I will check emails, and I only do Wi-Fi only. I'll import photos uh, via the iFi Mobi Pro. That way I can share it. I can edit in Snapseed or wherever I want to do the editing and share it around. I also draft up some new blog content for scheduling and publishing for when I return home. Uh, I use a, an app called uh, AI Writer, I believe it's, or it might be IA Writer, I can't remember exactly. But it's uh, fantastic. It 
basically takes over the whole screen and gives a sort of this Dookie Hauser, almost uh, typewriter style look. Very minimal, removes all distractions, and you can just you know focus in on on writing. So when I'm doing that, I'm using that app. Uh, I also use the iPad to FaceTime with my wife and baby when I'm out on the road. Uh, if I'm if I'm in the field, I use my iPhone. Uh, so I was recently in Seattle and uh, wanted to see my baby while I was at the bottom of the Space Needle. So we started FaceTiming at that point, and I got a fun photo of my baby and I FaceTiming. You can see the you can see her on the screen. You can see the uh, Space Needle in the distance. So it kind of feels like my baby was there with me. Whenever traveling, I always anticipate potential rain. So I keep my camera bags and my camera, my camera rain covers on hand. The camera bag rain cover, um, a lot of manufacturers are starting to include rain covers in, the, in with the bag. Some do not. Uh, if you do a think tank photo bag, it comes with it. A Tamrac uh, bag usually comes with it. Low Pro, same thing. Mindship, for some reason, decided not to include it, so you have to get the rain cover separate. Um, but it, they always safely store or neatly store inside of the bags in one place or another. They're fairly small, um, and many times they're seamless. Sometimes they're not seamless. The camera rain cover that I use is actually one from Think Tank Photo, and I love it. It has helped uh, when I needed it, so <laughs> it's always nice to have. And in, in number, you know, when you, you have unexpected rain or or snow or sand. You know, if you have a in a sandstorm somehow, um, if you're in a sandstorm, I actually would recommend doing more of a, a scuba diving type of case that really does protect uh, waterproof, which would then in, in theory be uh, air, you know airproof and sandproof too. But uh, if you only have a, a rain cover, then use that. If you're in a sandstorm, that's all you. I also keep with me uh, Optech makes. Uh, what I what I consider to be emergency rain covers, they basically look like camera molded Ziploc bags that are perf they're 100% clear, very lightweight. Um, you buy one pack and it comes with two. So I always keep one pack with me as an emergency if for whatever reason I lose my cover or if a friend needs something or some random person that I see needs it, uh, I'll just offer it because they're inexpensive and uh, you know I'd rather help someone out than see them lose hundreds of dollars of equipment in you know heavy rain. I do a lot of panoramic photography as well, and I, I wrote about this in my book, Go Wider with Panoramic Photography. And uh, but I do want to mention, I'm not going to go into detail about panoramic photography today, but I do want to say that if you are going to experiment with it, uh, I strongly recommend at a minimum a nodal slide, and that's what you see at the top right. That's a nodal slide. It allows you to uh, shift the camera forward and backwards so that the lens is centered over your tripod head rather than your camera being centered over the tripod head. Doing so will allow you to achieve the most accurate and distortion-free panoramics. Um, I also use the uh, panning clamp you see below on the, on the bottom right, which allows me with a ball head to level out the, the ball head and, uh, with the camera on it, and then I can pan that panning clamp instead of the ball head to make sure that I'm panning perfectly level. Um, and I use both of those products that I use are from Really Right Stuff, and they're made in the US, uh, but there's a lot of companies that make the same type of products. I use a Coast HP14 flashlight uh, for light painting as well as seeing in the dark. And I also have a LED headlamp from Petzl that I uh, travel with when I need the extra hands. Uh, and uh, I also have a tiny clip-on LED flashlight as a backup, which is the USB powered thing. Um, the Petzl headlamp that I have is also USB charge, chargeable. There's actually a rechargeable battery in it. And there's two advantages, advantages to this headlamp. One is it automatically adjusts for brightness, depending on how dark it is. And two, there's a red LED light as well. The advantage of red LEDs instead of or red lights, really, in general, rather than the white or yellow lights, is that your eyes don't need to readjust to darkness when you're using the red light. And having light blue eyes means my eyes are super sensitive. So while, so while if, if I was to use a regular flashlight color, um, 
if I turn it back off, my eyes would have to readjust, and it takes a while for my eyes to readjust. So red LEDs are super useful in that aspect. Again, you don't have to go with pencil. You can go with any one. Just find one that does a mixture of both uh, red and standard flashlight colors. I usually keep two or three protein bars in my bag for those times when I get over hungry or, or walk enough to drain my energy. I know that might sound uh, less obvious as far as photography gear goes for traveling, but it's actually super important. Uh, you know, you might find yourself in the zone and you might forget the fact that you haven't eaten in, you know, five hours. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, you got up at sunrise, before sunrise actually, you got to wherever you're photographing, and then by the time, sun, you know, the sun is up and you're doing some, you know, day, daylight um, photographs, at that point, you've already gone beyond your normal uh, breakfast period or whatever, so you're, you're going to you're gonna be hungry. So two or three protein bars, um, I, I love Cliff bars, but whatever, you know, whatever... Uh, Whatever you like, that's what I would suggest. I use a tiny, really right stuff tripod for super low angles or when I'm in places where aren't tri tripods are not allowed. Sometimes I'm on photo walks, I will only bring this little tabletop tripod. One of the cool parts about this is really right stuff also has this tool called the MTX tool, which it just looks like a little screwdriver with all these bits inside of it. And if you have a really right stuff tripod, this tool will actually tighten every screw. Um, that you need to tighten at in certain points, but it also um, stores neatly in their center column, which is really cool if you're using a center column for a tripod. But the extra advantage of that tool is it actually can go in between this tabletop tripod between the legs and the ball head, extending the height of the tabletop tripod. So if I'm out somewhere, for example, if I was to go to uh, the uh, top of the Empire State Building in New York City, you're not allowed to have a tripod. But no one's going to say something if you're just using this little tabletop tripod. And if I add, if I need a little bit of extra height, I can screw on that MTX tool, and now I've got a little bit extra height on top of it. Um, so this tool is actually really sturdy. Uh, this tripod, I'm sorry, is very sturdy and uh, could really hold a very heavy camera, although I think they, they limit it, technically limit it to like 12 pounds or something like that. But I've seen heavier cameras than that be on there. So it's a cool little cool little tripod. But this is the tripod that I use normally. This is my workhorse tripod. It's the TVC 24L from Really Right Stuff. Um, it is quite tall <laughs> without the center column in it. When I put the center column in it, the height is extended to, I would say, close to uh, eight feet in total. So it's quite tall when the center column's in it, but I don't leave the column in it typically because it just adds unnecessary weight because it ready goes really tall for me. The most popular ball head for, for really right stuff is the BH40. That's the one that I use as well. Um, and I use the one with the clamp, so just what you see up here on the screen on the right. Um, and it's really right stuff tripod ball heads are Arca Swiss, which means if, if you have a, 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 a Arca Swiss tripod, uh, you know, like clamp or what's called a plate on your camera, an L plate or a standard plate, it should work in this really right stuff tripod. Or if you went with a really right stuff system and then eventually switched somewhere else, then it wouldn't matter because this ball head could work elsewhere or the clamp that you get for the really right or the plate you get for the really right stuff will work elsewhere as well. Arca Swiss is tip really considered a universal um, mounting system for, for tripods and cameras. So um, it's very common now. I use Gitsu spikes for the feet of my tripod. Um, they fit on the Really Right Stuff tripod, but when but I went with the Gitsu ones instead of the Really Right Stuff spikes because Gitsu comes with these rubber covers that you see here, whereas the Really Right Stuff one simply replaced the rubber feet completely. So what what basically what that means is if if I'm photographing something in sand, if I'm like on the you know um, shore of, of the ocean let's say, and I want to dig my feet into the, into my tripod feet into the sand, then if I was using the really right stuff spikes, I would need to unscrew the rubber feet from the really right stuff spikes and then screw on the, um, the metal spikes. With the Gitsu ones, it's basically two in one. All I'm doing is popping off the rubber feet 
and the spikes are already there. So it just saves one additional step, getting me making photographs faster. Um, that's really the only difference. The Gitsu ones are also a little shorter. I would say maybe they're half the height um, or half the length, really, than the really right stuff ones, which means the really right stuff spikes um, probably dig in a little bit better into dirt and sand and stuff than the Gitsu ones. But uh, I've never had any issues, so I, I can't really complain about them. When traveling on a plane, however, if you're traveling with these, I highly recommend you remove the spikes before going through TSA. So my typical um, plan of action when I do this is I leave the rubber feet on my tripod when I'm going through TSA. Once I get through TSA, I take the spikes out of my bag and I put them on the tripod before I get onto the plane. And that way, once I'm you know, in the air and I get down to the other side to wherever I'm going, um, that point, I'm good to go. I can leave the airport and go somewhere and make photos, and I'm, I'm all set with as far as the tripod goes. So let's talk about travel clothes. Um, but before I uh, get into what I typically carry when traveling, I want to point out that the clothes you should bring 100% depend on where you are going. For example, I will not be discussing winter clothing. But if you are going to Antarctica, then the clothing you'd bring would be very different than what you'd bring to Hawaii. So I always travel with some sort of raincoat, and preferably one with some pockets for storing things that I might need on the fly. I have multiple products from a company called Scotty Vest, including the Quest Vest, which it has 42 pockets. Um, if this interests you, what I'm talking about right now about the Scotty Vest Quest Vest, um, I have a full review and uh, with video actually posting on my blog tomorrow. Um, so uh, if that interests you, you can just check it out tomorrow. Um, but I have this. It has 42 pockets. The picture you see on the screen right now is that vest, and you cannot tell there's 42 pockets. It's amazing. Most of their products have less pockets, though, in the 20 pocket range. But this one vest called Quest has 42. That's a heck of a lot of pockets. Um, the Quest vest can actually hold an iPad with no problem. Uh, it actually can hold a 70 to 200 to 8 with no problem if you wanted to. Um, but I actually do travel with this, and I travel with multiple lenses with my iPad, um, with battery backups, with batteries, with my trigger trap, with so much stuff in the vest, and you would never know it's all there. It's amazing. Um, they also make pants and shorts and shirts and hats, all with fun pockets. Uh, and so the beautiful thing about this is there's a hood built in, so I won't get wet, or my face won't get wet, my head won't get soaked in if, if, if I needed to put up a hood. Um, that's what's so nice about this vest in particular, but they do have other. They do have actual jackets as well. So, um, but you know, always travel with something that has some sort of storage for what you need, okay? Not storage just for anything, but storage for what you need. I bring Aquatech sensory gloves with me. They're fantastic. Um, they're warm, and they have tiny holes that open for, the, for fingertip access. And that way your hands can stay warm, but you can still feed your camera like you're used to. And this is great for sunrise because during, usually during a sunrise, it's, it's pretty chilly out, especially if you buy water. So even if it's not winter uh, where you're going or even if it's not freezing where you're going, these are really nice because they're keeping your hands warm but still giving you access to actually feel what your camera feels like instead of uh, having to use gloves that prevent you from actually feeling the shutter button or anything like that. I use a Tilly hat. This is the Airflow Tilly hat. Uh, you can see that it is um, has this nice like mesh material. What's really cool about this is that the mesh doesn't allow water through it somehow. I don't know how. Um, so this keeps my head dry, but it also blocks me from getting sunburn. It's lightweight, it's comfortable, and again, it keeps your head and neck out of the sun. What's really great about Tilly Hat is they have free loss replacement, so if you are traveling and you lose it, they will replace it free of charge. Uh, I don't know how many times they would replace it, but they have a free loss replacement. There's also a, a hidden pocket for your passport or for money that's at the top of the hat, so um, you know that's a nice, nice little feature. 
Uh, I never thought I'd be talking about socks when I talk about travel photography, but um, I started picking up uh, socks from Smart Wool, and because I, I've got uh, I have one ankle that that is not in the best condition, and um, I don't have the best back either, so I've been spending a little bit of extra money trying to find the all the the best sneakers and socks to help keep my feet feeling good and my back feeling good. And that's what these next two slides are going to be. This is one. This is the Smart Wool socks. They the material um, it's merino merino I believe is the name wool. Um, they're not too hot, and they actually do keep your feet cool, which is weird. Um, and they don't start to smell if you start getting all sweaty. They're they're just fantastic, and they're also molded. They're not just just like one seam one one seamless sock. It's actually cushioned materials sewn together, uh, depending on what you are going to be doing. So I have the uh, ones that are made for hiking. And I, that's pretty much what I wear whenever I'm out, is the hiking versions. So they keep your feet at a good temperature. They're designed for comfort during long walking and hiking. But check that out. Smart Wool is the name of the company. Then I also got this, these Solomon sneakers. Um, they're comfortable. They're a little hard when you first get them. Uh, and they start to break in. I, I've had them now for months, and they're still not broken in fully. But um, they're getting there. They're comfortable, super strong grip. There's a very strong tread under there. So if you're on slippery, slippery uh, roads and dirt, then it's these are great. They're waterproof. Of course, they're only waterproof up to your ankles or right above your ankles because that's where it, the shoe ends. But they're, uh, they're also easy to get on and off and easy to get through TSA. So this actually doesn't have a lace system. What you see there is sort of this bungee system to keep your shoes tight uh, and the the pull the pull part is actually in the tongue of the it gets stored in the top of the tongue of the shoe, so um, you can quickly slip out of them and then once you get through TSA put them back on with no problem. Okay, um, let's talk about some photographs now. Uh, I went through a bunch of gear. I talked about gear. I talked about clothing, but you know you're here for some landscape fun. So let's talk more about actual photographs. This was photographed way before Sugar Trap existed. <laughs> I wish that it did exist when I when I photographed this, but this is one of my most proud photographs I've ever made. Um, so I want to share how I did it and why I use the HDR technique and how I could have done it, how I would have done it rather, if Trigger Trap was in my hand. This was a super, super foggy and disgusting day in Boston, Massachusetts. I could barely see 10 feet in front of me, but I could see the sun trying to come through the clouds, so I made 27 different bracketed frames. And I used photomatics to compile worthy brackets together. In the end, I was very happy with the result of what I got, and then, of course, I finished it off in Photoshop at the time. I don't think I was using Lightroom at the time. Um, if I was using Trigger Trap, I would have used the LE HDR for long exposure HDR mode. I would have set my normal exposure, or what they call middle exposure, and then the EV steps that I would want. Now, for this photo, I use very small EVs to gather as much dynamic range in the brackets that I that my D700 could get. I had to do 27 frames in order to even see something worth you know, mixing. It, I'm telling you, this day was horrible. Now, what's really cool is that uh, this photo has been out there for many years now. It's been, sh you know, showcased on digital photography school as, like, you know, gr great HDR examples. I don't do much HDR anymore, um, but because this is one of my proudest, I'm, uh, I'm happy to say this was an HDR. And uh, more recently, a hotel that's actually in this photograph that you would never know that there's a hotel there, but there's a hotel in this photograph, and they wanted to license this for the hotel. So this is something that I did for me. In fact, I did this on a photo walk with a bunch of friends, and uh, you know, money was made from it. So when it comes to landscape photography, don't always do it with money in mind, but know that there is money out there to buy your landscape photos. This also happens to be from Boston, but it was a 
quite different trip. It was actually more recent. I think this was last year, maybe yeah, last year I think. Um, the exposure time was 60 seconds. I set my time to release to one minute and let Trick or Trap count for me. I wanted enough time to remove the bulk of the cars and people, but short enough to still see motion throughout the photo. And if you look closely, um, hopefully you'll, you'll, you're able to see this through the webinar, um, you can actually see uh, buses going by and people walking around. It's just very faint and ghost-like. Uh, that, that's the effect I wanted, but I also wanted it to be so filled with motion and stillness at the same time that the old church that's in the distance stood out, um, you know, well, really well. Uh, it might actually be a bank now, not a church, but, um, but yeah, so that was the effect I was going for. And this was actually the Wall Street style area of Boston, so it was the financial district. So there's a lot of movement going on. Sorry, I just need to take a sip of water. So trigger trap is perfect because the cable can be thrown in any pocket or bag. You always have your phone with you. Um, so when you see a moment worth photographing, there's no hunting for a cable release. This is a 25 second exposure. I could have done this without the trigger trap, but then I run the risk of shaking the tripod. This photo is from my home state, New Jersey, right after Superstorm Sandy destroyed so much of the New Jersey shore. And uh, this was a obviously a fishing pier that is now no longer there. Um, I went back after I made this photograph and there's even less, they haven't rebuilt it yet, unfortunately. This was a one minute exposure during a sunrise in New York City. I was down low. I used the trigger trap and phone trap to have the phone mounted on my hot shoe so that it wasn't sitting in the uh, East River of New York City <laughs> in the disgusting quarter, but like my foot was. Um, if I had a smart watch, like the Apple Watch or the um, Pebble, I could have started the trigger while standing comfortably rather than crouched down by my camera. Uh, you know, sometimes with landscape photos, you're, you know, especially with a bad back, you know, you, you're, you don't want to be crouched down all the time. You want to stand. And that's one of the nice things that Trigger Trap did recently is they added that um, smartwatch uh, capability of, of trig starting the actual trigger. This is from the same sunrise, um, but it was a very long exposure. This was actually with that uh, format high-tech Firecrest filter, the 16-stop ND. I wanted the river to be smooth as ice and the sky to have a very clean gradient. So this exposure time was three minutes and four seconds. And I'll tell you, I did do this a bunch of times before I got it to where I wanted it to be. So, you know, although I was there for the entire sunrise, I would say maybe, uh, you know, 10 minutes of it was me experimenting with, <laughs> with, with uh, different long exposure times to see, you know, get it just right for myself. To get light trails uh, from cars, you need the sun to be low enough or gone. But you also need enough exposure time to get the cars moving in the frame. This was a two second exposure. It's just long enough for, move, for movement in the cars and clouds, but short enough to keep all the textures that I wanted to show as well. This is a view of Seattle from a highway bridge just outside the city. Um, if I actually panned left, you would actually see the stadiums that are in Seattle, the ones, the two stadiums right next to each other. Photographing stars is very tricky. There's measurements and calculations you can make. I made this using a 20 millimeter lens at f2.8. When it comes to star photographs, you want a wide lens typically and a fast lens. So we, really 2.8 wasn't as fast as what I would have liked. If I was to do this again, I probably would have, would have used the 35 uh, f1.4 instead, but I got what I wanted. The exposure time here was 15 seconds. With star photography, if you go too long, then the stars are moving too fast in the frame. It'll be more like star trails or just lines, streaks of lines. If you go too short, you don't get enough light from the stars. You won't see the Milky Way. Uh, ISO is also super important with these type of photographs. I was up pretty high. I can't remember, but I think it was like around the 6,000, 8,000 range. Um, but uh, you want a camera that has great noise at a high ISO, like the Nikon DF, for example. Um, I have a friend who was with us that shot with the Nikon DF. I use the Nikon D810 for this photo. And we both have the same photo. His noise is a lot cleaner. 
because that sensor, the camera sensor, the Nikon DF, is designed for better high ISO noise. Full frame sensors also have better noise than crop sensors, so if you want to do some star photography, I recommend doing it with a full frame camera either way because you'll get better noise uh, rendering than you would in a crop sensor. And if you want to try photographing stars, I recommend using the star trails trigger in Trigger Trap. Uh, that way you can actually have it preset for, you know, if you want the stars moving or not, and things like that. So this is from the Palouse, Washington trip that I was on. Um, that I showed you with the uh, first photo of all the bags in the back of the minivan. This large pond is called Jordan Pond, and it's in Acadia National Park in Maine. It wasn't moving much, but enough that I needed a little bit of a long exposure to get transparency happening in the water. It was a sunrise, and the fog from the overnight mist was starting to fade. You can see that fog at the top left of the trees. I was standing on rocks in the water, but had waterproof boots on at the time. So it didn't matter if I happened to slip into the water. Uh, so the longer the exposure, the smoother the water will look and the more transparent, the more you can actually see through it. So that's a big advantage of doing, a, of doing long exposures. This is another photo from that same pond, just a sort of turn to the right a little bit. Um, there is this tree that's been down in that pond for a long time. Um, it's always interesting to see uh, photos from other people from the same location from years ago when you, when you know that nothing has really changed. That tree has been there for, for a long, long time. And if you look in the distance, you can actually see another, another photographer. Uh, I don't know if it's someone from our trip or not, but there's another photographer off in the distance there. This is Otter Cliff. It's also from Acadia National Park. These rocks were extremely slippery to begin with. Uh, during sunrise, the tide was rising high enough that there was no avoiding feet underwater. This is a great example of the importance of appropriate footwear. At the time, I didn't have those sneakers, and I actually am glad I didn't have those sneakers because even though they're waterproof, the water was over my ankle, so I would have been very wet. Uh, at the time, I was using uh, waterproof leather boots from uh, Clark's, and they did the job perfectly well. Uh, it doesn't have the best traction as far as on slippery rocks go, but I don't think many sneakers will have, or boots, will have good traction on slippery rocks. And these rocks are like s so smooth without water being on it. Um, they're very, you can tell in the photo how round and, and smooth they are. Imagine a smooth, shiny rock that's been, um, you know, smooth by salt water nonstop <laughs> that now is covered in, in freshly wet water, um, it gets very, very slippery. So uh, appropriate footwear, I can't stress the importance of that. This location is called Thunder Hole. I was there during sunset after high tide and when the attraction for tourists went, uh, went away. It's called Thunder Hole uh, because when the tide hits the back of a cave that's under these rocks, it splashes up really high in the air, wetting all the tourists and making a gigantically huge thunder sound. So if I had more time, I would have used the sound trigger in Trigger Trap in order to capture the ultimate time. And of course, if I was there during high tide and during uh, you know, that big tourist time, because that would have been really interesting. While traveling, I also experiment with street photography. Sometimes I shoot from the hip, from the hip. sometimes I do that fake look at the screen while making a photograph. Um, sometimes I use the motion trigger of trigger, of trigger Trap. It's important to keep trying new things, new techniques, new tools, new methods. That's how we learn and grow. Some other street photographs. The one on the left is from New York, and the one on the right is from Asbury Park, New Jersey. The cool part about Trigger Trap is that you always have it with you, like I've said. You always have your phone with you. I would be lying if I said I used every part of Trigger Trap. It's extremely versatile, packed with so many feet, amazing tricks. But I'm actually very specific about what I use regularly. I'm using the ND calculator and the solar calculator. Those let me determine optimal shooting times as well as shutter length for long exposures. The nice thing is, and there's, I have multiple uh, ND calculators um, on my phone, but it's nice when I'm already using the app to just stay inside the app instead of having to leave one to go to the other. So it was great they added that in there. 
Um, what you see here is the sound sensor. So I mentioned earlier that if I had more time at Thunder Hole, I would have used a sound sensor there. This is what that would have looked like. Uh, basically, you can choose the sound and let it trigger from that. Uh, motion sensor is also great for street photos, as I mentioned, uh, as well as photographing air shows. But the way the ND calculator works is pretty simple. You put that, you put your filter number in, you set your normal, your normal shutter, shutter speed with outer filter, and then it tells you exactly what shutter speed to use when the ND is in front of your lens. It's not too often I do long exposure HDRs, but there's a trigger for that as well, so I use it when I do need it. The phone trap also sits on top of the camera, just as you see it here. Uh, it holds the phone in place so you aren't left standing there you know, to hold it unless you really want to. Then there's iFi. iFi comes in two models, the Mobi and Mobi Pro, where the biggest differences are card size and what gets transferred. There are, there are other differences as well, but those are the most notable in my opinion. So the uh, iFi, the normal iFi Mobi, it's 8 gig or 16 gig. gig. It has a ad hoc Wi-Fi, so you don't need a router. You can just, um, you know, create its own Wi-Fi. It transfers all JPEGs to your phone or desktop. The iFi Mobi Pro is 32 gigs, also ad hoc Wi-Fi. It transfers all RAWs or JPEGs to your phone or desktop, or you can selectively transfer photos. That's the big notable difference, in my opinion, is the raw and also the selective transfer of photos. I only photograph in raw, only. So my camera never makes a JPEG without me knowing. I also don't want all my photos transferring to my phone. That's why I use the Mobi Pro. When I'm traveling, I choose which raw photo I want to share from the road. So I will start chimping my photos from the day and do a basic raw to JPEG conversion in camera. Literally, not no edits, just doing the raw to JPEG conversion. My Nikon D810 is set to save the JPEGs to the SD card. So when I do the conversion, that JPEG is not taking up space on my CF, my compact flash, but it, rather the Mobi Pro. I then lock the camera button on my camera to tell the iFi app on my phone that I want the photo transferred. Okay, so now it's transferring the JPEG that I just made untouched. Once the photo is on my phone, I can then do some minor edits within the iFi app or bring it into uh, you know, another iOS app uh, or editor to do uh, some editing of the actual photo. And when done, I can share it wherever I want, like to Instagram, or to uh, Facebook or anything like that. Um, by the way, right now Instagram does allow for portrait and landscape photos, so you, you're no longer constrained to square cropping, which is fantastic. I'm often asked uh, why photos transferred are fuzzy and pixelated. So if you see that, it is because your, raw, your, your device does not handle raw files natively, like your iOS device. Your options are either to only transfer JPEGs, which is what I do, or to pick up an app that can read RAW files. There's two that are available that, I, that are notable. One is uh, FilterStorm New, which can uh, read your RAW files, uh, and I think that's like $3. Uh, and then there's Photo Raw, which is, I think, uh, $10. So um, I don't know about their editing capabilities. I've never used them. Uh, I would. If I was to ever transfer raw files, I would get those only for the purposes of being able to read the files. Um, so, uh, so iFi works on so many cameras, and if your cameras, if your camera does not have an SD card, uh, you know, slot, then there is a compact flash to SD adapter that you could pick up that would, uh, you know, hopefully get that job done for you. Uh, I, do, I personally don't use the iFi cloud system, as it's not my point of storage for editing, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that it's out there and available to use, and I believe you get a pretty good amount of uh, trial. You, I think you get, and I could be wrong, so uh, apologize if I am wrong, it's either six months or a year free of the iFi cloud system, um, and I, I could be corrected when I'm all done, if I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, with the iFi Mobi, I know you get some sort of uh, trial of the cloud system. The first thing that I recommend doing when you get your iFi card is to set it up. Because without going through the setup process, you may find your results might not be what you expected. For example, 
I set the Mobi Pro to selective transfer immediately. Okay. Otherwise, every single photo I make will go to my uh, phone, which I don't want. I want to be selective. So don't forget to read the manual. Just because it's a SD card doesn't mean you insert it into your camera and forget it. The iFi cards are far more advanced than just being an SD card. So now that I've gone through my methodology for travel photography and use of the Trigger Trap and the Mobi Pro, along with some tips, I would love to answer some questions from the viewers. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah. It looks like one of the very first questions from Timothy is, can you talk about how the Trigger Trap works, how it is set up, and how to use it? He's not familiar with the device. Um, <laughs> that's a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, so the way it works is basically you download the app. Um, you have to pick up one of their cables. You see that the cable at the bottom left of the screen right now. Uh, basically, you, you plug in one end into your camera and one end into your phone's uh, headphone jack. And you turn your, the volume up on your, on your phone all the way because it really uses audio in order to tell your camera what to do. And then inside the Trigger Trap app is actually, uh, and I, could, I could actually share my iPhone screen possibly too if, if need be, but inside the, um, inside the app itself are different cable release modes, like a simple cable release. You can use it as literally just a regular cable release like you would otherwise. Uh, there's press and hold, there's press and lock, there's timed release, self-timer, time lapse, uh, time warps, distance lapse, star trails, so many, there's sound sensors, vibration sensors, so if you are near earthquakes, you can photograph earthquakes. Um, there's facial recognition, so if, when you see smiles, uh, motion sensors, there's the uh, HDR trigger, long exposure HDR trigger. trigger. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can trigger your camera depending on what you need. Um, and it's all inside of one app, which is, which is brilliant. Um, so I know that's, it's kind of hard to explain what it does in, in a short period of time, but <laughs> that's a quick, quick summary of that, the power of Trigger Trap. Great. Uh... We also have a question that says, what was the critical information in your determination of selecting a single lens? Okay, so uh, it depends on what, where I'm going, what I'm doing, and what the, what the goal is. Uh, that would be the first thing. But I find myself enjoying prime lenses more than anything only because Prime lenses are the, have the best quality, first of all, of, of all lenses. Once you go to a zoom lens, you're losing quality of, of the lens because it's, that's just the nature of it, even if you go to an expensive you know, 2.8 straight through lens. Um, but aside from that, just being able to carry light with simple prime lenses is just a great thing. So my typical, like if I'm not traveling, uh, my typical bag is a 35 millimeter and an 85 millimeter lens in the one bag. Um, once I'm traveling, I will throw in the 20 millimeter, and then I will also have that 20 to 300 in place of the 85. Um, but then there's times where uh, I don't, I know I don't need that much of a distance of, of the 300 lens, and I just want a better quality lens. Or there's times where I'm doing the portraits and I don't need uh, the 20 to 300 or something like that. So at those times, I will actually now bring the 24 to 120 with me. Um, when I was in, when I ran my tests and found some statistics through LightroomDashboard.com, um, I found that when I used my old 24 to 70 2.8 lens, I was actually photographing around f5.6 most of the time, and so I didn't need the 2.8, and I was only using that lens for portraits. So I didn't need the 2.8. I needed a 5.6. So Nikon has that 24 to 120 f/4 VR lens. So why do I need a lens that's a lot heavier, that is doing the same thing that the lighter lens can do for me with similar quality? So that alone helped me determine what lens I needed for portraits. When it comes to landscapes. It's, it's really a matter of, of what, 
what your goal is. Uh, if you typically with landscapes, you want a wide lens and you want a, a long lens because um, you're going to want to be able to mix up your your focal lengths or croppings and and your depth of field and things like that. So you want to have a, a good vari a variance. You could just go with a 20 to 300, and I know people who do that because it is a good lens. It's just not my favorite lens. Um, but 28 is pretty wide and 300 is pretty far. So if you really want to travel with just one lens, I would recommend getting a quality all-in-one zoom if that's your goal. Um, but what lens to go with really does depend on what your goal is because if you don't care about carrying extra weight, then I would recommend going with multiple lenses to cover the range instead of um, you know, the all-in-ones. Great. Have you used solar panel chargers to supplement your travel battery needs? Great question. Uh, on Black Friday, I did pick up uh, a Goal Zero um, solar charger. I have not tried it yet. Um, it's been sitting in the box, unfortunately. I haven't had a chance to even try it. But I do plan on doing it this year, trying out the solar charger to see how it does. Goal Zero um, is a brand that is growing so f rapidly when it, with solar uh, solar power chargers. Uh, my friend Colby Brown actually uses them when he goes to Iceland in the middle of nowhere um, when he does his travels. Um, and he's got a whole bunch of those type of, of things. All, I think it's all from Goal Zero. So he uses those to, to power his laptop on, on the go and things like that. Um, so I would only use it for iPads and, and iPhones um, and potentially camera battery recharging if need be as well. But um, maybe maybe sometime this year I'll have a better answer <laughs> than that. But um, So I have one sitting behind me ready to be tested. Stephen wants to know, do you use a flash, reflector panel, or any sort of lighting control equipment? Uh, okay, so for landscapes, I do carry with me, and this is not actually for landscapes itself. I, when I travel, I do carry with me a small 12-inch uh, reflector that folds up nice and tiny, uh, folds up to maybe three inches in diameter, uh, and that just I just stick it in my bag, and I've actually wound up using it multiple times to do random portraits here and there um, while out on the road, but. I, I don't ever bring flashes with me. I do have that, like I have the flash light and I do have the, the headlamp, which I could use on top of using a reflector if I really wanted to. Um, if I'm doing portraits, of course, that's different that I do use artificial light. I use um, Alien B strobes and I also have a bunch of Nikon speed lights. So, but traveling, travel wise, really only bring my reflector in addition to the flashlights that I have. Beth wants to know, how much does all your equipment in your bag weigh? Oh, good question. Uh, honestly, couldn't tell you. I haven't weighed it. I probably should. Um, it was a lot heavier when I brought the 24 to 70 and 70 to 200 with me. Uh, but I, 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 my guess is that I am close to, uh, I'm going to guess between 15 and 20 pounds total with the backpack. Um, that's my guess. I could be way off, but um, maybe I'll throw it all in the bag and, and, and weigh it next chance I get. Uh, Brayden wants to know, how much storage does the MindShift bag have for personal travel items, like spare clothes, laptop, toiletries, etc.? Really good question. Uh, so I went with the uh, second to largest size. It can hold a lot if you're not bringing as much stuff. Like if I was not bringing... Um, my all my filters. If I was not bringing my panoramic gear and a bunch of other stuff, then I could fit a lot of clothing in the top compartment. Uh, they do have an even bigger bag that can hold even more stuff. So uh, if I, depending, if I was going somewhere where I knew I could, I only need a little bit of clothes for a weekend or whatever, and just a little bit of gear for whatever I was shooting. I could easily throw in the clothes for a weekend and not worry about bringing a second bag. So there's a lot of space. Um, there's even a really big space on the side that's actually designed for a uh, one of those hydration water bags that you can throw in with a tube and stuff um, that I don't have in there. So I could throw in like socks and 
underwear and all that kind of stuff on the side of the bag as well. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of space that you could actually get clothing in there for sure. On the go, what would you recommend for an editing app, a photo editing app on iOS? Um, so I'll, let me just pull up my own, my phone right now. The ones that I use on a regular basis, the my favorite right now is called Darkroom app, and I think it's a free app, and they have a paid upgrade or two paid upgrades, something like that. Um, and then I also use uh, Snapseed here and there. But those are really the two that I use the most. I have a lot. I always experiment with new apps. But I, I really like Darkroom app right now because it allows me to make presets. Um, and you can share the presets around. So um, anybody who's watching, watches this later on, if you are going to try Darkroom app, check out my Instagram, at Scott Wyden. And you can actually download or take a screen capture of my preset shares as once they're on your phone you open up darkroom app darkroom app's going to scan your um, screenshots and it will automatically load up my presets in your darkroom app for free um, so that's a really cool feature that they're now allowing you to make and share presets um, sort of like like making and sharing presets for lightroom but on a mobile app Mark wants to know, when you are shooting nightscapes or starscapes, what do you use for dew prevention? Uh, I've never run into any issues with, with uh, any dew on the front of my lens, but um, I, I always have a lens cloth with me. Uh, I have a blower with me. Um, so I would, use, I would use whatever I had with me, or I have lens, uh, like, the fluid with me as well. Usually in um, uh, Zeiss has these, and you can get them from like Walmart or whatever. Zeiss has a lens wipes that has the fluid in it, so usually I'll I'll use that, um, wipe the lens to clean it, and then I'll use a regular lens cloth to make sure it's nice and dry and whatnot. But I've never actually run into having any dew issues. Um, could just be where I was when I do the the star photos, um, based on where you know someone else's <laughs> that actually does experience do issues. Andy says that you've talked a lot about sunrises and sunsets. For locations you're not familiar with, how do you confirm the point on the horizon the sun will intersect? Ooh, so I use this two apps that are great for, for tracking where the sun's going to be. The first one uh, that I want to mention is called Photopills, and that is awesome. Um, you can actually pre-plan a trip ahead of time inside of Photopills uh, and pre-plan a whole bunch of different things. And it has augmented reality built in as well. So you can actually point your phone up to the sky and really actually see where the sun's going to be at certain times rather than having to guess. Uh, the other one is the Photographer's Ephemeris. Um, both are, I think, around $10 or so. Um, and, uh, yeah, those are, those, are, those are my go-to apps for, for any planning. Um, but there's a whole bunch of them out there. In fact, uh, in, inside of Trigger Trap, it has a sunset sunrise calculator. It won't tell you where the sun will be, but at least you can calculate actual time. So. We have one user who is wondering, what do you do about travel insurance for your equipment? Uh, all my equipment is insured. I have business uh, insurance. Uh, I don't do it specifically for travel, but I do have insurance on all my equipment. Um, I, uh, if you go, if you become a member of uh, PPA, then which is the photographers, uh, professional photographers of America, you get insurance included. And then you can pay to have extra if you need the extra. Um, so check that out, um, or you can just check out. Uh, I forgot the name of the companies, but there's a bunch of companies. If you just Google, you know, uh, photographer insurance, it'll, it'll give you a list of a bunch of different companies that offer it. Um, but yeah, I get mine through the through this company that PPA uses, and it covers me completely. Um, Mark wants to know: Does the Trigger Trap phone holder work with an iPhone 6 with a case like an OtterBox? Uh, I have a 5S. Uh, I believe I, when I first got the Trigger the phone trap, I asked about the the 6, and they said that it does hold the 6. Um, I don't know about it being in otter box. Because otter boxes are much thicker than most cases, uh, so I can't say for sure. Uh, there are there are other products that hold phones um, on top of 
cameras and you know on tripods and stuff. So uh, if it doesn't hold it for you, then you know I, maybe they're working on something that's even bigger. I'm not sure honestly, but um, I know that it holds it holds a six okay without a case. I just can't say about a six with a case with the OtterBox at least. We get this question a lot in most of our webinars. It'd be great to get your opinion on it. If you take a photo with someone in it, like street photography, do you have them sign a copyright release? Great question. I talk about this in my in my uh, ebook on street photography. No. Uh, le that, well, okay. So I let me step take a step back. If you're in private property, yes. Uh, if you're out in the public on the streets, no. You legally do not have to if they're out in the streets. If you're going to use it for, uh, you know, me, I don't know, if, if it's a it's a it's a tricky tricky subject. Um, I actually wrote about this uh, in my book and also have a guest article on my blog about this from a lawyer, um, and it's just a tricky one. But really, the the easy answer is no, you don't have to because they're in public. Great. Jeffrey wants to know what ND filter do you use the most, or how many stops does this filter reduce? Um, so I use the 10 stop the most of anything, uh, and that's uh, right now I have the Lee filter 10 stop. I'm going to be switching to the um, Format High Tech Firecrest once that, that comes in. Um, but uh, yeah, so I use the 10 stop the most. I feel like that's uh, gives me the most amount of of leeway, it's actually the most fun to play with as well. Uh, sometimes I will do like a, a, a three stop and a two stop or something like that um, to get a little bit less. But uh, yeah, typically the ten stop because it it allows me to do a lot. Like the um, the photo that was in downtown Boston with the um, moving moving buses and people uh, with that old church in the distance, that was with a ten stop. Uh, around noon, so it was midday, and I was able to do that with that, that long of an exposure, you know, get that, that sort of blur and motion going on midday, the hard, you know, the most harsh part of the of, of, of sunlight. So We have quite a few questions today, Scott, asking if you'd publish a list of all the gear and apps that you've talked about today on your blog. Um, do you so, yeah, <laughs> sorry, you can finish. Um, no, that's it. We just have, okay. we have quite a few people that are, that are interested in a list with possible links and names of apps. Yeah. Um, so if you go to my website, scottwine.com, and type in slash blog at the end of the URL, I have a lot of the gear already there. Um, I will do my best to update it um, this week with the apps that I use as well. I don't have the apps in there. So um, I will, I'll try to update that. And if you sign up for my, uh, my newsletter, that's also on my website. Um, then I'll send out an email to my list, to my newsletter once um, once that's updated with all the uh, apps and stuff. So if you're interested in knowing all that, then um, yeah, just check out the website, sign up for the news for the newsletter, and I'll I'll get that out to you as soon as I can. Great. We have a few more questions about Trigger Trap. Can you use the Trigger Trap with an iPod Touch or Wi-Fi only iPads? Yes and yes, uh, <laughs> you can use it on any iOS device. And what's actually really cool, um, so you can use it on an on on, on uh, iPod Touch. And I know a lot of photographers that do this. And what's really cool is there's two, in addition to the app itself doing the trigger, um, there's two other ways you can trigger a trigger trap. One I mentioned already, which is having the smartwatch. So they call it the wearables mode. So either a Pebble watch or an Apple watch. And I'm assuming they're going to eventually have an Android version too. Um, but the other way is the Wi-Fi trigger mode. So you can actually use a second device. So if you want your, um, you know, your iPod Touch to actually be on with the camera, actually to do the actual trigger, you can set it to Wi-Fi trigger mode and then use your iPhone to actually do the trigger and then you can step away from your camera. Um, so that's a really neat feature that they have as well. And let's see. Um, what's the difference between a DC0 and a DC2 connection in Nikon? Uh, I'd have to look it up, honestly. I couldn't tell you offhand. 
No problem. Well, it looks like that that's all the questions that we have today. Scott, do you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, I appreciate everybody who's watching this now and later, and um, I hope you uh, learned a little bit about uh, things to prepare for when you're doing travel photography, and hope that inspired you to try some new things, and uh, thank you. And we thank you so much. Everybody make sure to go to Scott's website to learn more, and we'll have a recording available within a week on iFi.com. You can visit iFi.com to sign up for a free trial of iFi Cloud upload some of your favorite vacation photos and create an album to share. Uh, we'd also like to thank Trigger Trap. Remember that Trigger Trap Mobile is the ultimate camera remote for photographers of all skill levels. Make sure to check out TriggerTrap.com to find out more. And thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you have a fabulous rest of your week. Thank you, everyone.